Welcome to Africa 360. We're the program that goes across the continent for news and views you won't get anywhere else with a distinctly African perspective. I'm Chris Marilang. Do join us on Africa 360. This week, fresh from an extraordinary session in Addis Ababa, African leaders voted to remain within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, but not without demanding reforms of the world's court. This week, we ask, where to for the African Union and the International Criminal Court? Stay with us as we put this question and more to experts, the people, and of course, you, our valued viewers, only on Africa 360. Well, the International Criminal Court and its role in Africa have dom has dominated international headlines for quite some time now. But when we speak of international justice, what exactly does that mean in practice? In 1998, members of uh, the United Nations met to establish uh, the Rome Statute, and the aim was to identify four international crimes. Those were genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and indeed crimes uh, of aggression. So guided by the responsibility to protect, an international judicial system would step in where states were unable or unwilling to pursue uh, the perpetrators of uh, these crimes. That statute established the International Criminal Court, which is uh, currently located in The Hague in uh, the Netherlands. The ICC has prosecuted a number of high-profile cases on the continent, and heads of state have certainly not been immune from uh, the ICC's work. As you can see from uh, uh, this uh, uh, graphic behind me, eight countries are being investigated, and most of those are actually heads of state. The ICC's work began in the Democratic Republic of Congo with uh, uh, Thomas uh, uh, Lubanga, who along with uh, the Union of Congolese Patriots recruited child soldiers. Uganda's infamous uh, warlord uh, Joseph uh, uh, Konye is also on the ICC's wanted list, while the Central African Republic's uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba is uh, along with uh, Ivorian leader Laurent Gbagbo and his wife Simone they are all under uh, prosecution. And it's especially the prosecution of serving heads of state, most notably Kenya's president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, and uh, his deputy, William Ruto, as well as Sudan's uh, Omar al-Bashir, that have invited the ire of uh, the African Union. But will calls for reform and immunity of heads of state mean more cooperation between Africa and the ICC, or will the court's power on the continent be muted? Uh, this is exactly what was addressed by Africa 360 producer, Lindsay Schutel, who looked at the ICC's record and the prospects for reform. Peace through justice. Just over a decade ago, African leaders believed the only way they could achieve this was through the International Criminal Court. But since then, the continent's leaders have accused the Hague-based court of targeting Africans. Last weekend, they gathered at the African Union to vote on withdrawing from the court. The motion did not pass, but Africa is demanding immunity for sitting heads of state, most notably Sudan's Omar al-Bashir and Kenya's Uhuru Kenyatta. Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto knew they were meant to go on trial. They ran as election candidates anyway. Are you ready, William? The UN Security Council is the only other body that can put pressure on the ICC, and they've approached it. The question now, you know, that needs to be asked is, are we really taking one step forward and ten steps back? Because for 14 heads of state to gather in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, just last weekend, to actually make that pronouncement that a sitting head of state is above the law and should not be tried, sends a very chilling message to not only the world but particularly the African citizenry. So if any real change was to happen in the relationship between the AU and the ICC, what should it look like? The evidence points to the direction that we don't have a better mechanism or a better institution to be dealing with international justice other than the ICC. So you're all for the ICC? So Absolutely. Okay. Unless we can find something better, 
For now, this is the best mechanism we have in place. The only current alternative is the African Court on Human and People's Rights. But it's badly funded and located in Gambia, a country with one of the worst human rights records on the continent. The location of the court should not be the issue here. Instead, African states should be looking towards handling their own cases. But it's clear that an African solution simply doesn't exist for this African problem. At least not yet. Lindsay Shutal, Johannesburg. I'm now joined by Kwanguli Wewe, our very own Kwanguli Wewe, who has just returned from, as bureau chief from uh, Nigeria, but she's also just come back from covering the extraordinary uh, summit of the African Union in Ethiopia. So, Kwangu, during your time there in Ethiopia, tell us, what was the move? Was this a real uh, effort by African leaders to withdraw from the ICC, or was this just us journalists spicing things up? Well, Chris, um, basically what happened when we got there, a lot of hype. There was so much hype, so much discussion about the withdrawal. Mm. And as you're saying, the world's media was there. Mm. They were all there in Addis waiting to hear whether Africa would withdraw from the ICC. Mm. Two hours later, this is now the foreign ministers are meeting as the executive council of the AU. Obviously, it's closed doors. We get wind of it that uh, withdrawal is no longer on the table. Yeah. And that, of course, there were three options. It was either withdraw or mm. deferral, mm. or to discuss um, with the ICC reform. Yeah. So like as I said, two hours later, we were told withdrawal is no longer yeah. on the table. Mm. There was a lot of, um, as journalists, we began to analyze and wonder why um, they decided not to withdraw. Mm. Um, as you know, 34 states are signatories to the ICC, among 122. Yeah. But um, we're being told that um, these 34 states cannot just go to the AU and decide to withdraw. Yes. They entered into an agreement with into the Rome Statute mm. um, individually. So they have to go back to their parliaments for their parliaments, which is what Kenya did as well, mm. for the parliament to agree to this move. And that's, that's a very interesting point. And I, I think it's also a good point for us to bring up uh, a graphic that we used earlier on uh, that actually shows uh, the number of uh, countries where investigations are going on in uh, Africa. So as you can see, I think the decision, in my view, if you look at the number of prosecutions that are currently going on in Africa, irrespective of what you think about the number, it just goes to show that in Africa, it is a very serious consequence if the ICC or African leaders were, were to have decided to have withdrawn, don't you think? Absolutely, Chris, and this is something I guess they even realized um, just there before the heads of state arrived, just the executive council yeah. as well. I mean, they thought that, um, is it 34 states out of 122? Yes, In it would have. In actual fact, let's, let's, let's bring up uh, that, that pie chart that okay. gives us a sense of how many African countries are actually signatories uh, to the Rome Statute. Almost a quarter of the signatories to the Rome Statute are actually African states, and there are 34 up there. So really, Kwangu, in my view, it really shows the, the fact that when you look at it as a ratio, it's not surprising that so many prosecutions you think are happening on the African continent since the majority are African. Absolutely, Chris. And apart from that, they've argued all along. I know African states have come out and categorically said we're being targeted, hmm. deliberately being targeted by the ICC. but as um, other people have discussed on your show, it's been shown that most of those cases were brought to the ICC by Africans themselves. Mm. So that argument really didn't hold a lot of water among the analysts we spoke to mm. while we were in Addis Ababa. Well, some interesting views coming there from our own Kwangli Wewe, who was at the African Union headquarters over uh, the past weekend to actually monitor what was going on and what this means for the future of the ICC and Africa. Do stay with us on Africa 360 as we continue our focus on this subject. I mean, can a European country send their own citizens to come to an African court? Never would you find that. Welcome back to Africa 360. We are unpacking the decision by the African Union to remain a part of the International Criminal Court, but not without demand for reform. But joining me in studio to uh, help us unpack this issue in a little bit more detail is uh, 
a real uh, regular on Africa 360, and that's uh, Kofi Kwaku. He's a senior lecturer at uh, Wits University here in uh, Johannesburg. We're also joined by uh, Sipo Malunga, who is the executive director of the Open Society Initiative for Southern Africa. And last, but certainly not least, is uh, Tiseke Kasambala from uh, Human Rights Watch. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on Africa 360. Way back, I spoke to uh, Courtney Griffiths, uh, QC, and he's the man who had the task of defending convicted Liberian warlord Charles Taylor. And this is what he had to say of his experience at The Hague. The day I see George Bush led in chains like Charles Taylor from the United States to Holland to be put on trial, or when Tony Blair is subjected to the same indignity then I believe wholeheartedly in international criminal law. Until then, there is a battle for us as black people to fight here. So some, some very interesting views there coming from uh, Courtney Griffiths, who seems to indicate that there is an inconsistency in which justice is applied. Well, he says that unless uh, Tiseke Kasambala, he sees George Bush and Tony Blair also you know, taken to the Hague in chains, that until that happens, why the focus on African leaders then? Look, no one is arguing about the fact that there's an, uh, an even application in terms of how the ICC has gone after its cases. Mm -hmm. But that is not the reason to target the ICC in particular. It, it, and it's a, it's a good point, but uh, Sipo Malunga, when I look at um, the work of the... Um, uh, International Criminal Court. The interesting thing is that we do understand that the majority of signatories to the Rome Statute are from Africa. However, it appears that the majority of prosecutions and indeed investigations happen to be in Africa. Is nothing else happening anywhere else in the world? Uh, good question, uh, Chris. Be very careful what you sign up for. At, at the time that our African governments chose to sign up to the, to the Rome Statute, mm -hmm there was an expectation that it would never get to the heads of states. <laughs> so if you look at the early cases that ended up at the ICC, Lubanga, DRC, Jean-Pierre Bemba, DRC, and with time, Bagbo. So these are all losers, so to speak. It is only when the ICC started going for presidents that then the issue, that then, then it became a problem. Mm. Now the question is, do we throw out the baby with the bathwater? Yeah. One of the, the key points that emerged from uh, the uh, summit that was held in Addis Ababa was the view from African leaders that there was a need to strengthen uh, the African court on human and people's rights. Um, in actual fact, they were saying that it is better if Africans begin investigating, prosecuting, and interrogating uh, these uh, gross crimes mm. than the International Court. Is there something to this? Well, there is something to it that it's a, it's a really savage indictment to the Africans themselves for sending their own cases out there uh, somewhere in Europe now saying, okay, the European Union is going to try to recolonize Africa. But why didn't you deal with them at home? I mean, can a European country send their own citizens to come to an African court? Never would you find that. Mm -hmm. This is a point. So there will be an enormous amount of institutional bias mm -hmm. and institutional prejudices yes. against those who are not even paying. The African, if but, you look at the budget but, but of the ICC, that, 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 the Africans are not even paying anything. You know, uh, and they're signing know, up to that. No, f fantastic, Kofi, mm. uh, having said that. But here is the truth. Mm. The, the, the commission on people in hu human rights, the, the, the African Commission on Human Rights, mm -hmm. is based in the Gambia. Yeah. And if we look at the human rights track record of Gambia and its president, Yaya Jame, you can actually say that it's farcical to actually believe that any justice can emerge from a court that is based in a place like the Gambia. Well, it's, it's an in, uh, not quite true because you can have something sitting there and then the president could escape that. Oh, come but on, what is coffee, important, really? No, what I'm, I'm, well, are, are you really selling no, this no, to no, us today? But, but it is because we find that all the time. But what is really important is that Africans don't have the ducks in a row to really look at the connection, the nexus between crime, because that's the issue. It's not getting out of the ICC, it's the issue. Crime, the idea of punishment, the idea of criminal uh, justice, and then, most important, 
impunity. To In actual fact, that, that, that's a good point because um, earlier on, I did uh, catch up with uh, Fatou Ben Souda, and she's the chief prosecutor of the uh, International Criminal Court and the first African to hold that position. She believes the only way forward for the ICC and the AU is cooperation. The ICC, its creation, has been largely supported by Africa for it to come into existence. And throughout our, our, our operations, our activities, from the time that cases get referred to the ICC, through to our investigations phase, through to our prosecutions phase, for arresting of individuals, for protecting of witnesses, we have received immense support from the African states. Interesting point there, Tiseke, immense support from African states. Earlier on, you pointed out that a lot of the prosecutions were actually referred by the Africans themselves. But here is a sad indictment on Africa, closer to home here in the Southern African Development Community. There was a tribunal established by a regional economic community, the Southern African Development Community. And what happened? When a difficult case was put before it, what did they do? They dissolve the case. Tell us a little bit about that. Exactly. And I think this is an indictment when we talk about African leaders and we talk about the possibility of an African court that has a uh, criminal jurisdiction. Yeah. We should talk about how they've diluted the functions of all the, the existing institutions that we have on this continent. Yeah. One of them was the Sadiq Tribunal, which was doing an excellent job in terms of investigating cases mm. um, and looking into accountability. And then it went after um, <laughs> <laughs> Zimbabwe. Yeah. You know, it heard a case um, of Zimbabwean farmers who came with their case before the court and it decided against the Zimbabwean government, mm. President Robert Mugabe's government. Mm. And African leaders, Southern African leaders came together and now they've effectively diluted the powers of the Sadiq Tribunal. Mm. It no longer has the powers that it had to investigate such human rights cases that come before it because they argued that it did not have a human rights mandate. Yeah. And that is the problem. The question here is not the fact that African leaders should develop a court of their own to end impunity on the continent, mm. is whether they will actually give it the powers to actually operate effectively, and we haven't seen this happen. The most ideal situation is to strengthen our national judicial systems anyway. That should be the starting point. We should not go outside. We need not go outside for our own people to get justice. Now the question then is, if people are unable to get justice in their own countries, through their own courts, their own judicial systems, where do they go? Mm. There must be a commitment to actually ensure justice for people. If that does not happen, there has to be other places where people go for justice, mm. regional or international. A commitment to ensure that there is justice for the people of Africa, that they can find it in their own countries. Do stay with us as we pose uh, these questions to Africans on the streets and on social media, only on Africa 360. So we don't want to have uh, our presidencies or our state houses being the refuge of criminals. I think the case should be brought back here. I don't even think it should be there in the first place. Most people were a bit bitter at that time, so we were thinking, ah, oh, let's just take them to ICC. But right now, we're seeing that it's taking so much of their time, even as leaders, and it's making our country even look bad from outside. There will be a lot of delays as far as our country's activities are concerned. Because the, when the president is at Hague, who is going to be in the office? There are so many things which are supposed to be done by the president on a day-to-day basis. Yes, we need him here. Welcome back to Africa 360 Today. Our focus is on the relationship between the International Criminal Court and the African continent. And earlier on, those were the views of ordinary Kenyans whose country has become the focus of a tug of war between the International Criminal Court and uh, African leaders. But we also love uh, to hear from you, our audience, on uh, social uh, media platforms. And in actual fact, um, uh, this is our Facebook page. We asked our Facebook fans what they thought about the African Union's deliberations on whether to withdraw from the ICC or not. Well, Sindiso Valentine Moyo says, all African countries should stand together and withdraw from the International Criminal Court because it's a tool by Western countries to bully and continue colonizing Africa in disguise. But... Uh, uh, Duduzim Timunye is uh, clearly not in agreement. He says, 
If we withdraw from the ICC, what mechanism do we have to replace it with? Ordinary courts will not be strong enough to try high-profile individuals like heads of state. Now, the interesting thing, Kofi Kwaku, that we're getting is uh, Kenyans on the ground saying, look, this is making our countries look bad. All we want to do is our leaders to govern. The ICC prosecution on serving heads of state undermines this capability. What's your view on that? It doesn't undermine it. They, they, I mean, in clear, the, the very important focus right now is not about individuals or leaders per se, but people committing crime. So the connection, the reason why this whole debate is that there is what we call an, an element of causality. Yeah. What really got them to really say, we're gonna indict so and so? It's mm. because there is a presumption of crime that was committed. Africans now have to figure out how to find instruments, institutional organizations, to be able to solve that problem, the problem of crime on the continent. In fact, there's a close relationship between what the ICC has managed to do and the calm that we're going through the past five to six years. Mm. And it's very clear, in Cote d'Ivoire, after Gbagbo was taken out of there, mm. a little bit of quiet mm. in Liberia. People are going about this stuff. Mm. And so there is, there are indication that this is being, it could be working. So we don't want to have uh, our presidencies or our state houses being the refuge of criminals. I, I would actually argue that, um, if I play devil's advocate here, that there must be something to be said about Africans finding African solutions. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is an indictment to us as Africans. The fact that the only place our own people can seek and obtain justice is thousands of miles away in The Hague is an indictment to our own people. For me, I, I really do believe that Africans, if they have the commitment, mm. they can put in place systems, mm. justice systems that, that will serve their people. So and they don't. But yeah, we need to do I think yeah. we need to actually do that. Let's do that and then pull out yes. of the ICC. They don't Let's because put in place the systems and then we'll uh, seem to be in the wrong places. We said, okay, um, we want just justice for our people. But then when you look at most of the budgets or the institutions that are put in place, nobody is putting the money where they're supposed to put that money to make these institutions to function in the way that serve the justice for the people. I mean, yeah, the, the thousands of thousands of people, uh, uh, thieves, a uh, leader of thieves that are out there, that are now seeking protection from the African Union, it seems, mm -hmm. and they're buying a license for people this weekend to say, if you're a president now in Africa, if you're an African president, you have a special justice for you. We can't prosecute you <laughs> until you're in power. So, which means, if you can extend your stay until you're president for life, Nobody will go after but you. That's an interesting place for us to uh, pick up some of the views from our uh, followers on uh, Twitter. One follower, and that's uh, Vusi Allen Banda, says, maybe when we see a Western leader in the dock at the ICC, we will believe. Another follower who goes by the name The Dictator, ominous there, says, I'm not convinced we need an African court to deal with African problems, Tiseke. I, I, I'm afraid I disagree with some of your followers. <laughs> um, look, at the end of the day, we're talking about the victims of serious crimes here and the justice that they require and the justice that they need. All this high-minded rhetoric about African solutions for African problems is simply that, high-minded rhetoric to shield African leaders, abusive African leaders from the serious crimes that they've been committing across the continent for many decades now. Mm -hmm. And that is not an excuse. I think people are losing sight. It's the victims of all this that count, not our leaders. Mm. not a handful of African leaders. Mm -hmm. And Kenya, in fact, has been affected by years of impunity from Jomo Kenyatta's time to S Daniel Arab Sipo is either shaking or agreeing. I'm, I'm, I didn't quite pick that up. What, what is that? You know, <laughs> I, I, I want to lose the obsession with current leaders. Hissen Habre, the former president of Chad, mm. he left office, not voluntarily, of course, in 1990. Mm. He has been in Senegal for the past 22 years. Mm. He was only arrested this year in July. After years and years and years of negotiation, of calls, of trying to hold him to account. Yeah, but what's your point? What's your point my, here? My point is that it's, it's got nothing to do with current, it's got nothing to do with past. It's mm. all about a commitment and the will mm. to ensure justice. Isn't there something to be said in certain cases that political expediency must trump 
impunity. Well, that's the peace versus justice argument that yes. we've been having for many years now. And I think my argument is that I think peace and justice go hand in hand. Really? If you have accountability, mm. you ensure long-term peace. You can have short-term political expediency and short-term political dealings, but you will have the violence coming back and back. Kenya has seen those cycles of violence exactly because of that. Sacrificing justice in the name of so-called peace that only works in the short term because the people have not seen the accountability that they required or that they wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, that argument, I think, I don't buy that argument. Mm -hmm. I think peace and justice go hand in hand. Yeah. You can't sacrifice justice in the interest of peace. You cannot sacrifice justice in the interest of peace. And certainly Tiseke and, uh, of course, the rest of our guests here aren't buying that. Uh, but if you'd like to join the conversation, you can join us on Facebook, uh, on our group, or tweet us uh, at uh, Africa360 underscore ENCA. You can always send us an email at uh, Africa360 at ENCA.com. And uh, certainly until next time when we look forward to bringing you Africa like uh, you've never seen it before, do take care.